I received a review copy of Heckmeck and Kartenek from the publisher, so thanks to Zoch Verlag. If you've followed my channel for any length of time, you'll know that Zoch Verlag is one of my favourite publishers. Their range is diverse and bonkers, and at the centre of this catalogue sits a large number of chicken games. There isn't really a consistent concept linking these games. We've got memory games, speed reaction games, dice games, simultaneous selection and auction games. Some are designed by industry-leading inventors like Alan Moon and Stefan Dora. Several come from the brilliant mind of Rainer Knizia. The one defining feature of all these games is the presence of chickens and worms. These birds often seem to be awfully hungry, as well as ducks and herons and cockerels and other wild fowl, all illustrated in a very distinctive style by Doris Matthaus, one of the most prominent illustrators of the new wave of board games coming out of Germany at the turn of the 21st century. I always start my reviews by identifying a hook, the thematic or mechanical concept which draws players and retailers in. And weirdly, considering this is one of my favourite publishers, I struggle to identify a clear hook with Zoch Verlag games. They don't play by the rules, they break the mould. What we have here is a range of games designed by industry heavyweights, ostensibly marketed at children and covered in worms and farmyard critters, but actually containing many wonderful gameplay mechanisms which intrigue adult players as much as, if not more than youngsters. Long and short of it is, I get it. I don't understand it, but I am hooked. I'm Adam Porter. I design games and I review games with a focus on their success as products. A game can be tremendously fun, but if the game makers don't incorporate product design principles into their process, then even the most incredible tabletop experiences will struggle in a crowded market. The Chicken Games emerged around 20 years ago, starting with a very popular children's memory game called Zika Zaka Huna Kaka, which would be translated into English as Zigzag Chicken Poop. Perhaps wisely, in English-speaking countries, the game became known as Chicken Cha-Cha-Cha. My wife is Bavarian, and I've run the titles of these games past her, but it appears they're pretty much nonsensical even in German, so what chance do I have of interpreting them? Still, Hick Hacking Gackelwack is an insanely satisfying game title. It just trips off the tongue, doesn't it? Gloria Pictoria is a card game from Alan Moon. If you've ever played his big box games Union Pacific or Airlines Europe, this is essentially a streamlined card game using similar mechanisms. The game sees a bunch of chickens gathering collections of glamorous items. Each player starts with four cards in hand, and on your turn you take three actions from four possible options. Place a card face down to create a chest. Place a card face up onto a chest to start a collection. Draw a card or move the fox. When you place a card on a chest, it must match all the cards which are already there. When you draw cards, they either come from the face-up display or drawn blind from the top of the deck, though that costs two actions to do. At each of the three scorings, which take place sporadically throughout the game, the player with the majority of each item will score points, and the second place player will get a smaller reward. Now, if you've played your doubler card onto the collection, then those points are doubled. But if the fox sits on your collection, you're going to get nothing for it. Plotting the game on my engagement ladder, well, it's a fairly meaningless theme, but I'm going to award it some points for the artwork. And it offers a decent amount of interaction, most notably because of the passing back and forth of that fox. There's certainly some tension in the game as you strive to achieve majorities, but the feedback is pretty infrequent, with scoring happening just three times in the game. There is scope for clever play, but the decisions primarily revolve around pushing your luck and trying to outmaneuver your opponents. The game climbs eight rungs on the engagement ladder, a good score falling just short of classic status. The most renowned of Zoch's chicken games is Reinick Nitzia's dice game Picomino, also known as Heckmeck and Bratvermeck. The rulebook tells a daft story of Charles Chicken, whose writing has contributed to the popularity of roasted worms, and his uncle Sam from Chicken Town, Kentucky, the proprietor of worm roasting houses across the world. The rulebook refers to us as gambling squeakers, and our goal is to have the most worms in our claws at the end of the game. The roasted worm portions are laid out in ascending order to form a grill, and on your turn you roll eight dice and you set aside all dice of one value. You can then re-roll the other dice if you wish, and set aside dice showing a different result. At any point you can stop rolling voluntarily, but to be a valid attempt, 
you must have at least one worm result set aside. If your attempt is valid, and the total of your dice matches a roasted worm portion from the grill, or on top of another player's stack, then you steal that portion. Worm results on dice count as five when you calculate your total. And if your total doesn't match any worm portions, then you take the next lower valued portion from the grill instead. If you push your luck too far and you can't set aside any dice from your final roll because they match dice which you've previously set aside, or if your result is invalid because you don't have any worms, then you return your uppermost roasted worm portion to the grill and eliminate the highest numbered worm on the grill. The game ends when there are no more worm portions on that grill. Each player adds up their worms on all their tiles and the player with the most wins the game. The expansion to Heckmech, called Extra Wurm, introduces a new die, some special tokens, and a few wooden animals with unique powers. The Canned Worm, Sitting Hen, Raven, Weasel, and Golden Die are set up in specific positions on that grill. And if you take a worm portion with the Golden Die on it, that simply counts as an additional die for you to use on your turn. If you collect the Canned Worm, you can use it to avoid an invalid result, since you're always going to have at least one worm available to you. If you have the weasel, once per turn you can immediately re-roll all the dice you just rolled. The hen sits on top of your stack of worms, preventing them from being stolen by other players. Unlike the other animals, the raven can never be taken by a player. Instead, when you take a tile which the raven is sitting on, you gain a brat worm token, gaining one point. These are taken from the supply unless it's empty, in which case they're stolen from in front of another player. And as usual, the player with the most worms at game end wins. With or without its expansion, Picomino or Heckmech is a bona fide classic. The game has a fun, nonsensical theme. It's got loads of interaction, largely of the take that variety. It's high on tension and feedback. And though it's a fairly random affair, there are still loads of really satisfying push-your-luck decisions to be made throughout the game. With 10 points, it sits at the top of my engagement ladder, and that might explain why it hasn't gone out of print since its release in 2005. And while it's overshadowed by Nitzia's more complex titles, Tigris and Euphrates, Ra and Modern Art, and hence often overlooked, this unassuming little game is among his best. And in 2022, we have a new card game based on the Picomino formula, Heckmech am Kartenek. I'm always wary of titles like XXX the card game. Will it ever really live up to the original? If it was meant to be a card game, wouldn't Nitsu have designed it in that way in the first place? Well, I needn't have worried, because Heckmech am Kartenek stands up as a solid game in its own right. This new game has players auctioning off roasted worm portions, one per player per turn. And if there's one area where Nitzia excels, it's an auction. Each player starts with a hand of six cards, and on your turn you play any number of cards of one value. Then you draw a new card. Later in the round, you can add cards to your play area, but as in the dice game, you can't add cards of a value that you've already played. For a bid to be valid, your collection of cards must feature at least one worm card, and they're worth five points. On any of your turns, you can pass. Now, if your bid is invalid, you simply take the lowest tile from the grill. If you're the first to pass, you also draw two cards. If your bid was valid when you pass, though, you can also steal the uppermost tile from another player's stack, so long as your total from all your cards matches the number on that tile. When everybody has passed, the values of all valid bids are compared and the tiles are distributed to the players, with the highest bidder getting first choice, and so on. After several rounds, when all tiles have been distributed, the player with the most worms wins. Heckmech am Kartenek does an excellent job of capturing the flavour of the original. The market is swamped with small card games, far more so than dice games, so this game might have not quite such a distinct identity as its predecessor. And there is a lot more competition in 2022 than Picomino had on release back in 2005. But it still has some fresh new ideas up its sleeve. The card game does lose a little bit of the excitement from the original because of the lack of dice. The immediacy of a dice roll gives instant feedback to players, both positive and negative, and that associated dopamine rush is addictive. The card game just can't compete with that. But replacing the dice with cards allows the players more control, and turns move faster. In the original game, each player was tasked with completing all of their dice rolls on a single turn while the other players waited. 
In the latest version though, card collections are built over a number of turns, allowing players a peek at their opponent's plans. There are opportunities to read your opponents, deduce their intentions and counter with your own card play. It's really satisfying. The game has a feel of Stefan Dora's For Sale, with players assessing the tiles on display and considering whether this is the round to go big, or whether to cut your losses, take a lower value tile and reserve cards for a potentially more lucrative future round. But the hand management also really enhances the push your luck aspects of the game, especially when striving to accumulate exactly the right total to steal a worm portion from an opponent. Each card draw is like a card flip in blackjack. Will this next card get me to 21 or will it push me over? Heckmeck and Kartenek scores one less point for feedback, but it gains one point for meaningful decisions, maintaining its very high score of 10. If you like the dice game, there are enough familiar features to recommend picking this one up too. And if you didn't like the dice game, this is a rare case where I'd say you still might enjoy this sequel. It depends what your objections were, of course, but this version really does have a very different feel. Before Picomino had any expansion or re-implementations, there was already a spiritual successor in Knizia's Sushi Zokim Gokelwok, released in English with the far more boring title Sushi Bar, and also available from Gigamic with the superhero theme and the new title of POW. We're told that Willy Wing the Heron was sick of fried worms, so he decided to set up a sushi stall. Sadly, the quality leaves a little bit to be desired, so the chickens are going to want to seek out the tasty morsels and avoid the fish bones. On your turn, you roll five dice, then you may re-roll up to two more times, setting aside any dice you wish along the way. And if at least one dice shows sushi, you might take a morsel from the display. The number of dice showing sushi determines which tile you take, counting from left to right. A similar system applies with fish bones, but on your turn, you can only take one tile, so you're going to need to choose Tasty Morsel or Rotten Bone. Well, that seems like an obvious choice, right? But not so fast, because at the end of the game, you're going to be comparing your stack of sushi to your stack of bones, and any sushi tiles stacked higher than the height of your bone stack are discarded. So it's important to have a balance of point scoring sushi portions and negative scoring fish bones. Of course, it wouldn't be a Zika Zaka game without a degree of take that, and in this game that comes in the form of chopsticks. If your dice shows blue chopsticks, you can steal sushi from another player's stack. With red chopsticks, you can steal a fishbone. When the game ends, when the last portion's taken from the central display, the highest scorer is going to be the winner. Sushi Zok is a little bit simpler than Picomino, and it's even more interactive. Tiles are stolen frequently from each other, and though the basic dice rolling is a simple Yahtzee mechanism and nowhere near as interesting as Picomino's system, the classic Knizia scoring is really satisfying. In Knizia's Tigris and Euphrates, you collect cubes of several different colours, but your score is equal to the cubes in your smallest set. The Sushi Zok has a similar feel. You might be inclined to stack your sushi high, but it's not going to help you if you've neglected those fish bones. The total score on my engagement ladder system is once again outstanding. Sushi Zok features fewer meaningful decisions than Picomino, but the interaction is increased. The Yahtzee mechanism has been used in so many different games before that this one doesn't quite have the same distinctive feel of Picomino's dice mechanism, and the meanness of the game might put some players off. But Knizia's balanced scoring is a really clever system, and it's always nice to see it crop up in one of his games. Shiki Mickey, later released by game writers Match of the Penguins, is a speed perception game from prolific Luxembourgish designer Jacques Simet. If you've played any of his other games, Ghost Splits or any number of ugly bug games from Dry Magia Spieler, you'll know what to expect. We have a deck full of pheasants strutting in their finest garments. Shiki Mickey is a German word describing something which is pretentiously fancy. A player turns over one card after another, and if an item of clothing matches on two cards, the first player to call it out wins all the cards. If two or more items match, players race to grab one of the blue pawns. The cards are split between the players holding those pawns, and if two cards are identical, then the first player to grab the red pawn wins all the cards. And finally, if a card has two worms on it, the first player to knock the table wins all the cards. If any player makes a mistake, they must discard one of their cards. And when all cards have been played, the player who gathered the most cards wins the game. 
Shiki Miki is among Jacques Zymet's earliest designs, and we've seen him hone this type of game over subsequent years with games like Ghost Splits, Cockroach Salad, Dodolido, but Shiki Miki is still a fun example of the speed perception genre. The theme is, of course, meaningless, and as a simple race, the game is very interactive, but I hesitate to give it the highest rating because the interaction is really simplistic. There's certainly a lot of tension in the game, though, and it offers up constant feedback but there really aren't any meaningful choices to be made. So the game totals eight points. I'm making a minor deduction for the slightly confusing hierarchy of patterns and calls. It's not the smoothest of systems, but climbing seven rungs still points to a really enjoyable game, even if it's not a genuine classic. Hick Hack Im Gackalack, also known as Pick Picnic, is a simultaneous selection card game. It's a re-implementation of Stefan Dora's Razia. Here, chickens, pheasants, turkeys, and geese compete to get the best corn while avoiding hungry foxes. At the start of each round, one corn cube is placed in each of the six poultry yards. Green corn is worth one point, blue corn is worth two, and the rarest yellow corn is worth three points. The players simultaneously reveal a card from their hand, indicating which yard they're going to be visiting. Now, if you're alone in visiting a yard, you eat all of the corn there and gain those victory points. If multiple players visit the yard, they decide together how they're going to divide that corn. And if they can't agree, then they're going to have to duel. And they do this by rolling the dice and then adding the value from their card. The highest result eats all of the corn. If you played a fleet foul card and you find yourself in a crowded yard, you steal one green cube automatically and then take no further part in distribution of cubes or jewels. And if you played a fox, then you're not going to eat any corn, but instead you'll eat any birds that find themselves in the same yard as you. And if two foxes find yourselves in the same yard, well, you're never going to share. You always duel to eat all of the birds. When all players have resolved their cards, more corn is added to the yards. And if any's left after a round of play, then it accumulates for future rounds, meaning there's better and better rewards as the game goes on. When all corn has been distributed, players count up their points from corn and eaten poultry, and the highest scorer wins. Now this one's great. I really enjoy it. One of the frustrations in simultaneous selection games like Go Nuts for Donuts or Libertalia is the tiebreaker situation when players visit that same spot. But it's handled really nicely here. The opportunity to come to a group decision reminds me of that brutal distribution by mutual agreement in Dragon's Gold, but it's less harsh here because if you can't agree, you enter into a fun little dice rolling mini game. A nice moment of push your luck without any substantial rules overhead to make it feel clunky. The decision of when and where to place your foxes is really fun too. Lots of corn accumulating on a space probably means lots of poultry are going to turn up at that spot, but they know that I know that, so maybe I should send my fox somewhere else. The theme is well implemented, the interaction is satisfying, there's loads of tension, there's loads of feedback, and though it's largely a luck fest, there are really fun choices to be made too. The game sits on the highest rung of my engagement ladder. Hick Hack, or Pick Picnic, is certainly an underappreciated gem. Collectively, these games illustrate the power of brand recognition. There's no obvious through line in this range, no key mechanism which is always present. No one box size or designer or central narrative. What we have is chickens doing human stuff. The picture book illustrations of Doris Matthau and a broad creed of family weight, highly interactive tabletop games. 20 years after zigzag chicken poop, the farmyard branding remains, presumably because it sells. And it sells because it's familiar. It takes time and tenacity to build loyalty among your target audience like this. I admit that I don't fully understand it. There's something uniquely German at play here, a taste for the gently grotesque, which we also see in Dry Magia's range. For me, of course, part of the joy is exploring something so distinctly foreign. Germany's answer to Britain's Roald Dahl and Quentin Blake. But it sure helps that the games stand up. Every game discussed in this video is worth your time, and the Picomino range in particular is outstanding. Whether playing with your family or squeezed between headliners in a gaming evening with adults, I'd encourage you to dip a toe into the surreal, feathery world of Zikazaka. Let me know if you've enjoyed any of Zock's chicken games. Are there any which I ought to be checking out that I haven't covered here? And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit like, 
subscribe, and I'll see you next time. All the best.